first speaker we have is uh, Kristen Underwood, and she is a PhD candidate in civil and environmental engineering here at the University of Vermont. And she's going to be giving a talk today on the role of forests in maintaining water quality in the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, so we welcome Kristen. Good morning. Um, as she mentioned, I'm giving a talk today on the role of forests in maintaining water quality in the Lake Champlain Basin. And just before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Tom Yuzo, from the Civil and Environmental Engineering Program here at UVM. And also my collaborators, uh, Corey Miller from Friends of the Mad River, and Matt Whitten, uh, Managing Director at Addison County River Watch Collaborative, which monitors water quality in six basins in uh, the Addison County region. And Friends of the Mad River is, of course, over in Chittenden County, on the other side of the mountain in the Mad River watershed. So forests have long been recognized for their water quality benefits, including water filtration and retention. And here in uh, the Lake Champlain Basin, we're fortunate to have a long-term monitoring data set for major tributaries that drain to Lake Champlain. Um, and, and these data, the long-term data, do suggest a positive correlation between water quality and forest cover. Um, but at the local level, towns and regional planning commissions are really in need of more um, finer scale uh, data to aid in their decision-making process um, for uh, stormwater management, for example, and reductions of phosphorus loading in the context of the Lake Champlain TMDO, phosphorus TMDO. So uh, fortunately, we also have a number of um, volunteer watershed monitoring groups around the state. And um, here in the Addison Chittenden County region, we have two groups that are very long standing, the Friends of Mad River and the Addison County River Watch Collaborative. They've been monitoring for over a quarter century, um, believe it or not, since the early 1990s, um, for things like phosphorus, E. coli, and turbidity, and some other constituents as well. Um, and so we have that data set that we can look to to understand if there may be geologic soil um, or land or land use drivers um, for water quality patterns that we see in these watersheds. So we set out to um, compile some data from 36 monitoring stations maintained by these volunteer groups. Um, they're dispersed throughout the um, upper reaches of these watersheds, and so. They're giving us a finer scale picture of water quality in these subsheds. And we look to data specifically from years 2010 through 2015, six years worth of data for these 36 <coughs> stations. And uh, the first step was to delineate the, the watersheds draining to each of these stations. And so, for example, here in the Little Otter Creek, um, what we did was to look at two unit areas of analysis, the subshed level and the corridor level. Um, most of these water quality stations are um, located along the main stem of the, the river, uh, not always, but generally. And uh, so in order to maximize the independence of our observations, we delineated the direct, direct drainage areas to each of these water quality stations. So for example, uh, in the Little Water Creek at station LOC 14 and LOC 10, we delineated this direct drainage area of land that drains directly to this uh, segment of the river between these successive stations. Um, so, so, and then on the, the corridor level, uh, we did the same thing, looking at just the corridor, that, that narrow area of land draining directly to the stream network, um, and along those tributaries that drain directly to the segment of the main stem between these two stations. So we have two unit areas of analysis, the subshed and the corridor level. The corridor level, this is how we uh, define the corridor in this case. We went to the VHD Cardo layer, the blue lines on the topographic maps, for example, and buffered those um, with variable widths that were based on the Strahler stream order of the line and segments. So these are somewhat arbitrary, although kind of loosely guided by um, management um, approaches that are in place here in Vermont. Uh, but generally speaking, we have um, the width of the, I'm sorry, the width of the, the buffer width increases um, in distance as you go up to the stream order. And for those that are familiar with the ANR River Corridor layer, 
Um, this, our buffered layer is slightly different. The ANR quarter layer is developed for a different purpose, really looking at those mid to higher level um, streams that have infrastructure within the floodplain, and the goal there is to really reduce fluvial erosion hazards within those corridors. Our corridor on the left is a more, maybe a more comprehensive corridor buffered on all the stream segments, including those fine uh, stream order number one. So within each of those unit areas of analysis, the subshed and the corridors, uh, I compiled the land cover data and the soil data. So land cover, we looked to the 2001 Lake Sham Plan land cover data set assembled by Austin Troy and others here at the UVM Sal Lab. And so we're looking at percent urban, percent ag, percent forest, percent water, percent other in uh, each of those 36 subunits of area, either at the quarter scale or the subject scale. So here we can see the subject scale and at the quarter scale, um, we've also compiled the same statistics. Similarly for soils, we looked to the CERCO data sets, um, joined those with the table 20 attributes to get at the parent materials of those soils and summarize um, soils present in each of those 36 unit areas of analysis in terms of their percent till, percent glacial lacustrine, percent alluvial, and so forth and so on. And also not pictured here, we did the same for hydrologic soil groups A through D. A hydrologic soil group being those um, lighter, sandier soils that have a higher infiltration rate. Um, D at the other end of the spectrum are those um, clay and silt rich soils that tend to have more runoff potential, less infiltration rate. So we compiled all this information along with uh, mean water quality concentration data for each of the 36 stations, and then used a Pearson correlation uh, analysis to understand if we have strong correlations between all of these variables or not. And what are pictured here are the, the subset of those variables that did show a strong positive correlation or negative correlation to water quality. So for example, we have uh, those watersheds that had high percentages of agriculture uh, in their direct drainage areas tended to have higher mean total phosphorus concentrations, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, but perhaps a little bit surprising is that those watersheds or quarter areas underlain by predominantly glacial lacustrine soils, the silt and clay rich soils derived from glacial lake deposits, um, were strongly positively correlated also with total mean phosphorus and turbidity. Uh, when we look at and compare the two unit areas of analysis that were developed, the subshed level and the quarter level, we see slightly stronger correlations to water quality in general for the quarter um, units of analysis. So I'll be <coughs> presenting results from here on in terms of quarter uh, direct drainage areas. So here's just to summarize that same table in words. Um, positive, strong correlations to water quality included variables uh, for the percent glacial lake soils, the percent very low or low infiltration soils, and percent ag land use. Conversely, negatively correlated to water quality um, were um, the percentage of moderate infiltration soils, HSGP group, uh, and the percent for land use. So this underscores the importance of keeping those intact forest blocks and forest riparian areas um, for preserving water quality in our watersheds. The next thing we thought about doing was considering those strong correlations, would there be any use in um, using those physical characteristics, the soil, the land cover characteristics, as a predictive tool in a way for watersheds that may have not as much data as, as ours here? Um, can we use just the soil and the land cover characteristics to predict in a, in a broad sense or a coarse sense what the water quality um, might be emanating from those areas. And so we did a hierarchical clustering analysis, which is a bottom-up clustering method. Um, we took input data for all 36 watersheds, uh, subsheds, and um, clustered them together using this algorithm. And what you get on the outset is a branched diagram that identifies clusters of similar observations. And, uh, Subsequently, when we examined the water quality data for these clusters, um, we found that they grouped uh, into three main groupings. And the next slide will show you uh, the water quality results for these clusters. 
Um, I'm not presenting E. coli results here because we had uh, a few watersheds that didn't have uh, sufficient um, records in terms of E. coli data, but we did have turbidity and total phosphorus data for those six years for all 36 stations. So on the left panel, we have mean turbidity. Uh, this is a mean of the mean values for all 36 uh, uh, watersheds uh, grouped into the three clusters. On the right panel, we have total phosphorus. Uh, along the x-axis, there are these numbers correspond to those clusters in the previous slide. So in cluster three, for example, we have eight or nine, nine watersheds. In cluster two, we have eight sub-watersheds. In cluster one, we have uh, 19 sub-watersheds. And when we summarize the water quality for each of those clusters, we find that those Subsheds grouped into cluster one had relatively low mean turbidity values as well as mean low total phosphorus values. In contrast, uh, cluster number three subwatersheds had elevated levels of turbidity and total phosphorus. So it appeared that we could use the soil and land cover data, at least in this region of the Champlain Valley, as a kind of coarse predictive tool for water quality. Um, what you see pictured there are confidence intervals around the so where do these show up on the land surface? Um, our cluster one watersheds really comprise those um, headwaters regions along the spine of the Northern Green Mountains in the Mad River watershed over here and along the upper reaches of the Nehaven River, the Lewis Creek and Middlebury River. Um, in contrast, so these are the ones that had very low levels of turbidity and phosphorus. Uh, in contrast, out in the flats, the Champlain Valley lowlands, where we did have a history of glacial lake sediment deposition, we uh, have some watersheds that with generally high, much higher levels of total phosphorus and turbidity. And then the, the mid-level watersheds, uh, the number two cluster watersheds, occupy these mid-elevation areas in the lower Midbury, lower Nagaden, and lower Lewis Creek, mid to lower Lewis Creek. So um, we're as a Riverwatch collaborative group, we're kind of encouraged by these results. We can we feel that we can use um, in areas where we have sparse data, sparse water quality data. We may be able to use uh, land cover and soil data to as a predictive tool in a way, um, and and it may help us prioritize activities within those watersheds. We, we're in a, a time and an area of sparse resources financially and otherwise, and so it's helpful to have a tool that can help us zero in on those hot spots of, of um, nutrient and sediment delivery to the lake. And this may be a tool that could be used by us and maybe by other regions throughout the uh, Lake Champlain Basin where they have more sparse water quality data. This is not to say, um, these results are not to suggest that forest and headwaters don't have their own issues. Um, and we're um, struggling with these a little bit in our Addison County region. We know that the forested headwaters are underlaid by steep slopes and low infiltration soils, and they tend to concentrate stormwater runoff and deliver it much more quickly to the lowland areas. So we're kind of seeing a dual um, management strategy here where we focus on hot spots of phosphorus and sediment um, contributions in the lowlands, but in the headwaters, we're really thinking carefully about those legacy impacts in our forest areas, such as old skid row and trail and road networks that are prevalent in these areas that tend to concentrate funnel stormwater runoff. And so we're engaged in practices that will slow, spread, and sink and disperse that stormwater in the headwaters and hopefully slow the rate of flow and runoff to the lowland areas and thereby uh, reduce channel erosion in our downstream areas. So with that, I'd, I'd like to just acknowledge that part of my funding is supported by the University of Vermont through the research on adaptation to climate change. Um, the Addison County River Watch Collaborative with Friends of Mad River have each been supported um, generously by the uh, analytical services provided free by La Rosa Labs. And uh, we also received of the collaborative some funding from a Vermont Watershed Grant to support um, some of the sampling and analytical work. And I'll take any questions. Yes. Um, could you speak about that a little bit? 
in this slide? Yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, they're, they're fairly strong, our values, in terms of the correlations. And what I'm presenting here are only those variables. We had a full suite of variables, including percent alluvial, percent uh, developed, percent um, uh, water, and so forth. We had a full suite of variables. What I've, what I've presented is just a subset of those variables that did have strong correlations. We had other um, variables that had relatively weak correlation to water quality, and one that kind of surprised us was uh, percent developed use was, was not a very strong correlation. Um, only in terms of land cover and land use, only um, agriculture and uh, forest came out as a strong so that strongly low correlated. Or? Yeah, so in the case of forest, it's an inverse relationship. Strong, but inverse. So the more forest you have, generally speaking, those watersheds were um, yielding uh, better water quality. Yeah. Uh, really great talk, thanks. Um, or up here, I was wondering how spatially autocorrelated your glacial or custom soils are with your percent agriculture. Yeah, that's a really great point. So I guess correlation does not suggest causation, so we have to be careful when we, when we um, describe or interpret the results. Um, but generally speaking, we did notice that um, those areas underlain by glacial lacustrine soils tended to also be those areas that were heavily cultivated and or developed. Um, most of the areas in these watersheds that we've been monitoring are sparsely um, developed. Uh, use Little Otter Creek as an example. We do have um, some uh, areas of soils so we want to get to land cover. We do have a Bristol Village in the red. Red shows you the developed land areas. Um, but generally speaking, these watersheds are sparsely developed. And so um, the flat areas tend to be great for cultivating. The silt clay rich soils of glacial lacustrine orage, origin tend to be um, rich for farm production. And so they tended to be the soils and the areas that were developed and cultivated the <coughs> most. So they are very spatially out of work, for sure. Thanks. Um, I'm really curious about the water quality concentrations of phosphorus and turbidity in the lowland streams. And as you and I have talked about before, it's like, I don't know, what is the expectation for something like that? You know, 10 and 20 doesn't seem to be right. But it seems like your analysis gives us an opportunity to look into that question by actually taking your model, your statistical model, dialing your forest all the way up to 80 or 90%, dialing your ag all the way down, and see what do we get, sort of what's the intercept for total phosphorus or turbidity at those. And I think that would be a really interesting exercise to just give a frame of reference of what do we expect in low elevation glacial lacustrine areas if we sub out the effective agriculture. Right. No, that would be a really cool approach. And, it, and I don't know if you're getting at this either, but I should mention too that the water quality concentrations that I've presented are a mean value for a range of flow conditions that were encountered in spring, summer, or fall, not winter. Um, they don't. Um, they're not all low flow values. They're, um, and, and we know that the standards of Vermont in terms of water quality and industry standards in particular are based on low flow or base flow conditions. So I have actually subsetted the water quality data into the low flow condition. And I think we can, um, I didn't bring the results here, but I think we can back out of that. What is the minimum percent forest cover where we have watersheds in attainment, so to speak, in terms of phosphorus or turbidity? These watersheds differ in terms of whether they're cold water or warm water streams as well, so they have different standards in terms of turbidity. Um, but that might be another way to get at maybe that threshold of forest that would be useful, or threshold of ag that would be useful to um, maintain water quality. Yeah. Right. <coughs> the land cover data doesn't distinguish it. It seems like it would be interesting to try and separate out the influence cultivated crops where you have to ground for a lot of the soil pasture? Yes, yeah, for sure. And I know that some of the um, edge of field studies that are being done by folks like Snow Environmental are getting at some of those more detailed, nuanced pieces of data. I chose to lump cultivated and pasture together, mostly because in our Addison County region and elsewhere in the state, they tend to rotate through sometimes cultivated versus pasture, or at least cultivated versus hay, and hay is often hard to distinguish from pasture. And so 
we chose to lump the, all the categories together, but I think you could really get at personal health. 